My parents were dead, to begin with. They had died a week earlier, and while I was obviously sad, it was not the crushing blow that it could have been. It's just that I was an only child, and we were distant emotionally, if not physically. They were both professors. My parents were kind, frugal, attentive, fiercely intelligent, and wholly unemotional. As their sole heir, I got everything. They had made a decent living, which means that the sum total of their financial assets was just enough to pay the inheritance tax on their home and I moved in. I was clearing out a lot of their worthless old shit, and they had a lot of worthless old shit. When I started working through a collection of books in the guest room that had been my bedroom 18 years ago. One book caught my eye. While most of them were headed for the library, goodwill, or the trash, I figured this one could be worth something, if for nothing else than the fact that it looked at least a hundred years old. I opened it up to a random page in the middle and skimmed the words. You're reading this, Peter, and we're clearly dead. I snapped the book shut and looked around the room. Pet as a mouse. What the fuck? What are the odds that my name would appear in this random page in my parents' house right after my parents had died? I hadn't marked the page, so I could not find any context. To be honest, I didn't really want to. I opened the book anyway. Random page, dealer's choice. You need to get it together, Peter. There's a demon in the room. Nope. I closed the book, placed it on the bed, and walked to the door. Of course it was locked, despite it having no lock, as I found to my great frustration in my waning hormonal teenage years. I had inherited my parents' logic and just enough of their emotional distance to know what I had to do. I crossed the room and opened the book again. Peter, there isn't much time. It's trying to cross over, probably under the bed. I looked instinctively downward and saw nothing unusual under there. Wait, there was a thin plume of smoke, barely perceptible. Oh shit, read Peter, read. You have to stop it from entering. I know that the logical part of you wants an explanation, but that same logical part must be telling you right now that the explanation has to wait. Now is the time to act. God damn it, they knew me so well. I ignored the steadily increasing billow of fumes and read furiously forward. In the cupboard across the room you will find a pocket watch, a rosary and a small canister of Morton salt. Retrieve those now. I crossed the room to my old dresser and opened it up. I shuffled a few random things around. Why did my parents have a bird's call? Until I found an Elgin pocket watch and the salt. But no rosary. I read further. In the sock drawer, Peter, near the back where you used to hide your magazines. Clearly this was my mom writing, and there would be some serious therapy issues to address later. I opened up the drawer and reached behind the obvious false back. I retrieved the onyx rosary. The smoke was beginning to choke me now, and flames were beginning to leap up from under the bed. Put a salt ring around the bed, son, and do it now. So my dad had taken over the pen. I really wanted to sit and look ahead in this book. The words were not materializing as I read. They sat in faded ink, bearing the marks to indicate that they had lay there for all time. What else was written? No time for questions. I made the salt ring. I felt like an idiot at first, because I saw nothing happen. Then I noticed that the smoke billowing upwards was confined to an ellipse around my bed. The only plumes that continued to haunt the room were what had been there before the salt ring was made. Time to go back to the book. 
You need to hold the demon at bay, Peter. Stop the watch and hold it in your left hand. I looked at the pocket watch. It seemed to be a hundred years old. It was silver plated and had a single crown at the top. I pulled it. The ticking stopped. I put it in my left hand. Now hold it there, son. Pick up the rosary in your right. It was clearly my father writing again. He was the only one to call me son and had such a knack for making me feel awkward, showing no realization or concern about what he was doing. How was I supposed to hold a book, a rosary and a watch with two hands? I awkwardly held the book in the watch hand, ignoring the growling sound now emanating from beneath my childhood bed. It wobbled as I read. The demon is subdued. Remember that, it is important. Now he will rise. You know that feeling when you open an oven at 400 degrees, when a whoosh of heat lifts up to embrace you? Imagine that coming from your bed. I ignore the figure now standing before me. I was terrified, but if I let go of my one lifeline, fear would be all I had left. I was too scared to stop reading. This next part takes courage, Peter. You have to face the demon. There's no one else in the house to do it, and he will be nearly uncatchable if he gets loose. I closed my eyes and counted to five. My dad always tell me to do that when things got especially rough. When I ran out of numbers, I ran out of options. Read or... Nope, just read. With your rosary hand, reach past the flames. This will hurt. Grab the demon by the neck. Nope, nope on a rope. I ran for the door. It was still locked. When I was younger, my father read me a poem called The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. I didn't understand a damn word, but my parents didn't have the emotional capacity to convey disappointment, approval or encouragement, so I have no idea if my dad was let down. Instead, he explained to me that most people are content to be minor players in the game of life and simply don't want to be great. I said that it made no sense and asked him why anyone would want it. He simply retorted, in his logical way, by asking me if I was the most popular kid in school, or the most athletic, or had the highest grades. When I said no to all of them, he asked if I was doing anything at all to change that fact. Again, I said no. Well, he responded to me, if you have no ambition to be the greatest of a few hundred children, how do you ever expect to be great in the world of adults? Isn't it because you're happier staying where you are? A lot rushed to me at once. My parents were dead, their stories were written and finalized. Mine would be one day too. Did I really want to live a life where I was afraid to lose anything? What would that mean when, at the end, I lost everything? I rose to my feet, held the watch aloft and advanced on the demon. It had the form of a man, the outline subtle yet undeniable through the flames. He looked at me and smiled. I wrapped the rosary around my fist and wrapped my fist around its neck. Fuck it burned! It gave me an inhumanly angry glare, but did not fight back as though its hands were bound. I grasped the watch tighter. I knelt to the ground and pulled it downward. Surprisingly, I had the strength to slam it to the floor. The demon whimpered. Shit, it hurt. Ignore the pain for now, Peter. You have to open the door. The reading got bleary as tears of pain welled up in my eyes. Feel for it on the ground. I reached in deeper under the bed. I was sure that my skin was melting off. But I found a handle and I yanked it upward. Wedge the handle in the space between your box spring and the edge of the bed, the book continued. Some distant part of my mind reasoned that my parents must have known about the demon portal under my bed, raising a lot of questions for another day. 
I pulled my hand back in pain after I had forced the open door into place, but made myself keep reading. I wanted to be done with this, so I could writhe in agony and disturb. Push the demon down the hall, it simply said. I looked at its yellow eyes and was confused for a moment. Then I realized that it was scared. I didn't know what I was fighting for, really, but I suddenly was aware of just how powerful I had become. I grabbed the monster's neck, shoved him in the hole, and he fell. His scream echoed on the way down. I closed the hatch. The next five minutes were spent in fetal position, cradling my right hand. I did not notice until much later that the smoke had nearly dissipated. When the pain finally ebbed, but did not disappear, I examined my hand. Not a scratch on it. I opened the book again, not even bothering to look for my lost page. The pain in your hand will persist for some time soon, but it will be fine physically. The pain will be coming from another place. I suddenly remembered my father limping for the last five years of his life with no explanation as to its sudden onset. My attention went back to the book. That's your cross to bear for the time being. Let it go. For now, there's work to be done. The chapter ended just like that. The next one was a chapter of an unrelated novel that was incredibly boring. When I looked back to the previous chapter, my parents' words were still exactly as they had appeared. The book did not seem to have been altered in any way. Now what? All I know is that everything that seemed so important can't hold my attention for more than five seconds. To be honest, if you told me that my previous life, bank account, car, job, friends, everything, was suddenly gone forever, I would actually be okay with that. Hell, it would be a relief in some way. There's a bigger fish, a whale, swimming in the ocean of my existence. I have absolutely no idea what it is, but I intend to catch it. It's time to search my parents' house. It's time to search my parents' house. One single book had seemed to append everything I knew about time and space. What else did they have hiding in here? Both had been professors, but neither in theology. My father was a professor of English literature, and my mother was a physicist for fuck's sake. It made no sense. Or maybe a lot of sense. I was still a bit too shaken to figure things out, and my hand still burned like Satan's hemorrhoids. I walked absent-mindedly to the top of the stairs, sat on the first step, and started riffling through the book. I didn't know if I wanted to find the text exactly the same, or find that it had inexplicably vanished. I had no idea which one would make more sense. That's not true. I wanted to find the text. I wanted to discover the strange. Something was calling me. I wanted to answer it. I found it. Randomly allocated throughout the book was the advice that I had been given. Reading through it made little sense, as the narrative was not punctuated by real-time demon wrangling and pants shitting. So, the narrative had been there the whole fucking time, penned and published god knows how many years before my birth. I don't know what to take from this. I resolved to pick my way through the whole book. It was at least a thousand pages, but there clearly lay answers within. I snapped it closed and walked downstairs, planning the time that I would set aside to read it. My dead parents were in the kitchen. Mom was played out on the table, skin pallid and torso strewn open like a dropped taco. Dad was behind the table, checkered napkin around his neck, 
hands working furiously with his knife and fork. He was eating my mom's intestines. His face was grinning with ghoulish delight as he pumped back and forth with his knife, cutting through bristle and bone. The lower half of his face was covered in blood. He continued to pump rhythmically as he slowly raised his head to meet my gaze. Without breaking eye contact, he pulled out a gelatinous piece of cartilage with his fork and passed it to my mother. She took the fork in her mouth and slowly began to auto-cannibalize herself. Then she, too, pivoted her gaze at me and grinned. One of her eye sockets was empty. I screamed, or at least tried to, and slammed into the cupboard behind me. I fell on the floor with a crash as the cupboard door burst open and pots and pans rained down on top of me. I shot back to my feet, dazed, and grabbed wildly for the watch, the rosary, anything. I reached into my pocket, but my hands only found the car keys. I waved them in front of me fruitlessly, as though they were a talisman that could protect me from the horror I had just seen. I focused my eyes on the scene in front of me. Nothing was on the table. I was alone in the room, with the only motion coming from a lone, swirling tin lid to a forgotten pen. Perhaps demon hunting was going to prove more difficult than I thought. I sat on the couch in the living room with a steaming cup of chamomile tea by my side. It's hard to say if this act of mimicking my parents' habits was intentional or not, but perhaps imitating them wasn't as bad as I thought when I was 17. The book lay open on my lap. I didn't bother hunting for a page. I just opened it up near the front and began reading. That scene must have shocked you, Peter. You were attacked by a demon upstairs and it damaged you in ways that weren't physical. You must realize by now that everything you saw was in your head, but that doesn't make it less real. You need to find a way to heal yourself or the damage might permanently affect your untrained mind. I snapped the book shut. Nothing like mom's soothing advice to comfort you when you're down. I paced the room. I was at one hell of a crossroad. If I continued to pursue my parents, things would just keep getting deeper. There'd be no going back. I found myself wondering what led my parents to whatever decision they must have faced. I imagined them discussing their fate. I could see my father pointing out that fear of death creates something that never existed before and that this fear was its own kind of demon. My mother, in her infinite logic, would have responded that death itself was real regardless of our actions and that every human birth is nothing more than a delayed death sentence. They were right, of course, and if chose not to follow now, it would not save my life. I was going to die at some point, and when the time came, the only thing I would have left was the ability to say I did that. I crossed back to the couch and opened the book. Start with the smallest demon, son. My father's advice ended the chapter and gave me no more insight. What. The. Fuck. I racked my brain to think of what that meant. When had my father ever talked about a demon? I was crying. Buster Duncan had punched me, hard, and taken three of my best G.I. Joes. He had squeezed my neck until I denounced ownership. When he let me go, I ran home at a full sprint. In a rare moment of near-human compassion, my father had hugged me as I cried. He's the worst kid in the world, Dad. He makes me feel so small. He's a demon! I gasped through sobs. Well, son, don't be controlled by him. If this is the way that he lives his life, if hurting other kids makes him happy, then he really is the smallest kid in the world. 
Buster Duncan was the worst piece of shit that I knew growing up. He lived to cause anguish to other kids. Despite my father's assurances, he was significantly larger than anyone else in our class, on account of being held back a grade on two separate occasions. I had the great fortune of growing up on the same street as him. I wondered if he still lived in the same dump at the end of the road. What did idiots do when they grew up? I made it to the house in under five minutes. It looked worse than it had when I was a kid. Past the three rusted autos and the elegant collection of weeds sat the screen door. It reeked of stale cigarettes and sadness. I knocked and heard a grumbling from within. His mother, who looked miserable just to be alive and angry for having to face a visitor, waddled to the threshold. Crumbs stumbled from her mumu. Yeah, she offered in a way of greeting. Hi, um, Mrs. Duncan. I'm an old uh, friend of Buster's from his childhood. Could he... um... could I see him? She eyed me suspiciously for several awkward seconds. He's out back, she finally croaked in a cigarette-stained voice. I followed awkwardly through the ramshackle home and toward the back porch. She sat back down on the couch. Buster Duncan stood smiling in the backyard which was little more than a dirt patch carved from the surrounding woods. He was bigger and fatter than ever. But more than that, I could tell that he was still just mean. The look was unmistakable from anyone who had been pounded by a jerk as a kid. Buster, I said, descending the porch steps slowly and deliberately. I don't know if you remember me. Peter, I offered. I came to a stop in the dirt, ten feet in front of him. You used to call me faggot lips. His smile was as unwavering as it was stupid. I came here to tell you something. To exercise a demon, if you will. I clutched the pocket watch in my left pocket and the rosary in my right. You made me afraid to walk down the street when I was younger. I had so many bruises on my arms in elementary school that Child Protective Services actually showed up to question my parents about beating me. I gave a wan smile. I think CPS decided it was impossible that anyone as boring as them could even make a fist. His glare was unchanging, his hands clenching and unclenching. But it was more than that. I went on, my voice cracking just a little. You made me afraid to be. You made me think that there was something so inherently ugly and wrong with being Peter that I deserved it. It might just sound like childhood bullying, but it wrecked my self-esteem, which made me think I was weak and therefore deserved it even more. I didn't realize until years later that you were the one who was wrong. My breath hitched, and the beginning of a sob escaped my lips. And that I could not keep you from being small. I could only choose whether or not to feel smaller. So I want to say something I should have long ago. I advanced until I was two feet away from him, and I leveled with his chest. I forgive you. Truly, I sighed. I choose to exercise this demon. It was then that I realized his eyes were yellow. The demon screamed and swung at me. I was too shocked to pull either item from my pocket and simply stared agape as his fist made contact with my chin and bounced harmlessly off. He shrieked and started clawing at me with essentially no effect. My sleeves were slightly ruffled. I could only gawk in confusion as it became more and more agitated, swinging harder and harder in a fruitless endeavor. It let out a final scream, erupted into flames, 
and turned to sprint into the woods. The only thing that came to my confused mind was shock at just how small it was as it receded into the darkness. I turned back to face the house, imagining that his mother would emerge to investigate the noise. She didn't. I finally turned back around and saw something in the dirt that I had not noticed before. It was a granite marker. I approached it. Buster Duncan, born 1-10-79, died 1-9-13. Nothing more was written. I stared in silence for some time. Finally, I opened the book. The page was the last paragraph of a chapter. There are many ways to go out into the world and face the demons that haunt its son. Those are the ones that may destroy your body. This is how your mother and I met our physical end. Never, ever forget that any battle worth fighting is one that you may very well lose. But it is impossible, completely impossible, to kill any one of them while a demon still lives inside. No weapon will work. Which is why I should tell you now that the demon you sent back into the hole was not harmed, just vanished, and he is likely quite angry with you. Be forewarned, and know that we're proud. Of all the things in the whole fucking book, it was the last sentence that caused the greatest impact. As I turned the page with my right hand, I realized that it didn't hurt anymore. I smiled. The next chapter was entitled Into the Woods. I frowned. It was almost dark. I remember thinking, as a child, that heroes going on great adventures must feel no fear, that the only reason they struck out in the first place was because they knew they were empowered in a way that made them ready to face any challenge and that the reason people listening to their stories trembled in fear is because they were listening and not doing. The greatest of hunters, I had decided, simply were not afraid. I realized, as I climbed cautiously into those twilt woods with nothing but a book, a watch and some beads, that I had been full of shit. I was terrified. I was terrified. I had brought nothing to prepare me for a hike through the woods. What little waning light remained was on borrowed time. I felt pretty foolish. But if I hadn't followed the book to the letter, I'd be dead by now. I'd rather face the unknown journey than give up trusting the book. Forward march. I crossed the dirt path that ran behind every house on the block and marked the border of the forest. I was able to peek through the trees fairly easily at first, but as I got deeper in, the branches got thicker and the sky got darker. Soon, I was fighting against near pitch black. I saw a clearing up ahead. The waning moon was shining just well enough through the darkness that I could see the trees surrounding it. I made for the clearing and got there in a couple of minutes. Just before I emerged into the light, a face appeared next to the tree at my eye level. I yelled, screamed, but this time made sure that I did not reach for the car keys, which had proven worse than worthless against the demons in my head. I pulled forth the rosary and pocket watch, thrusting them both bravely in front of the face. It was a printed picture nailed to a tree. Missing, it announced to the world. There was a picture of a smiling bald man, a last seen on date from about three weeks earlier, and the name Gordon, with the last name no longer visible due to weathering. I laughed in relief. Well, Gordon, I'm sorry, I said aloud. 
if you've been gone three weeks and they think that you might be in the woods, then you're probably dead. I walked into the clearing, feeling guilty about my emotional snap to comedy, but it had been a really long fucking day. The moonlight was just enough for me to open the book again and start reading. Walk forth, son, to release what's trapped. This part ended the chapter. I felt more than a little annoyed. I had already gone through a rather arduous process to release an internal demon. Did Dad not realize that fact? I sighed and continued through the clearing and into the trees. At first, I felt a slight sense of metaphysical purpose as I went forward. I was crashing through darkness, trying to find a light. The sixth time I fell down, I started to get pissed off. The last several messages had been pretty explicit. What if I had misinterpreted this one? It was just a chapter title that read Into the Woods. Maybe I had completely botched the meaning. I turned around. Oh shit. There was darkness in every direction. I couldn't go back, or forward for that matter, since I had no idea which way was which. Of course, I had left my cell phone back at my house. I punched a branch, ow, then picked a direction and started walking. In retrospect, I thought as I tripped over invisible roots and ran into painful tree trunks, it seemed a poor choice to forgo my cell phone due to the belief that salt and a pocket watch would suffice for being prepared. Actually, I forgot the salt. Maybe I was giving myself too much credit. I really wanted to check the book at this point, but it was beyond impossible with the trees covering the moon. I'd have to wonder. I had lost all sense of patience or purpose by the time I found another clearing up ahead. I was so relieved that I almost sprinted, but clocked my head pretty hard on a low hanging branch and actually hit the ground. The ego rush that I had acquired from successful demon hunting finally dissipated in that moment. I got back up and wandered blearily toward the clearing, more irritated at my mom and dad than I had been since my senior year of high school. I got into the opening and did not see anything of significance at first, so I sat down to take a rest, and I heard breathing. It was a raspy sound that lacked a clear location. It was definitely not human. I stood up and wielded around, looking for something big and mean. I found something frail and small. The breathing was coming from a fox pup, laying on its side with its leg in a trap. It looked to be in the throes of death. I checked the clearing to make sure that we were alone. It seemed to be so at the moment. The trap was the variety that had a snapshot claw. It was clamped around the fox's leg with a sizable amount of dried blood surrounding it. Clearly, it had been there for a while. I approached it to heroically rescue the fox. And failed. It turns out that those traps are fucking hard to open, which I guess is the point. I finally found that I could push the heel of my shoes against one end and pull the other just enough to pry open the jaws. I pulled the trap forward and let the fox's paws slide out. He didn't move upon being free. The fox was clearly exhausted and near death. I tossed the trap aside and reached out to pet it. The son of a bitch bit my hand. I yowled and pulled back, cussing at the creature. He did not stand up or move in any way. I wasn't bleeding. I figured that the bite had prepared me, so I went in for another, more careful look. The fox was dead. The final trauma of being forced out of the trap, followed by a last-ditch effort of self-defense, clearly was too much for the damaged creature. 
I sat down on a rock and took in the silence for a minute. I used to go on walks in the woods back here with my dad. We would go forth into the woods, bonding over the silence between us. I know it sounds odd, but it brought us together. The walks waned in frequency as I grew into my teens and eventually stopped altogether. I realized in sadness that I could not remember which time had been the last. I wondered what I would have thought if I'd known it at the time. I missed my mom and dad. I picked up my parents' book and started reading in the moonlight. The death of the fox should illuminate the fact that a physical release and a spiritual release are often inseparable from one another. Never face a demon without this fact in mind, Peter. I looked at the fox, who still had an open mouth and open eyes. I wondered if animals cared about not being buried, and wondered why we did. I turned back to the book. Moreover, know this. You cannot hope to defeat the demonic nature in the greatest of beings if you are unable to see the angelic nature in the least of them. Despite the bite, the fox was waiting for you. Remember that. I stood up, grabbed a handful of dirt and sprinkled it on the animal. It was a symbolic gesture, but that was all Polynices needed, so I left it at that. The book went on. Now go home, Peter. The teenage angst returned. I'd like to, Mom, but this wilderness jaunt does not seem very well planned now, does it? My voice echoed bizarrely, so I looked through the trees. I was at the border of the woods. Just beyond the trees to my left ran the dirt path that traversed behind the backyards of both my house and Buster's house. I had wandered into a circuitous road and ended up right back where I started. Isn't it irritating when our parents are right? I headed through the trees and emerged onto the path, which was bathed in moonlight. I read as I walked. No person can achieve great things alone, son. Trust the man in black. I appreciated my father's words and all, but that was a little creepy. As I walked towards the house, I began to hear rustling. It wasn't natural. Neither was the sulfur smell. I looked to the left, into the woods that I had just exited. And there it was. The demon was clearly grinning as it charged forth from the trees. This one did not look like a man at all. It sprinted on cloven feet and its glowing yellow eyes left trails in the air as it ran. At least ten feet tall, with curly goat's horns, it was by far the most terrifying of the three that I had seen. I didn't have time to grab the rosary or drop the book. My left hand had barely clutched the pocket watch when its cannon of an arm made contact with my temple. I tried to open my eyes, but which way was up? I couldn't wake up fully on account of the dizziness, but I couldn't sleep because of the noise or heat. Why the yelling? No need for that. I finally was able to prop myself up on two elbows and look around. There were flames in every direction. A ring of salt encircled me and the inferno was unable to penetrate it. Past the salt, there was only fire and a demon. He sounded pissed. I was not alone in the circle. A man I did not know stood between me and the demon, crouching slightly like he was ready to fight. I noticed vaguely that he held an onyx rosary in his left hand. He was facing the demon and shouting. The roar of the fire and the demon combined was deafening. He held his tree trunk arms forward 
as though he wanted to crush us, but something seemed to be making him hesitate. The strange man turned his head to face me. He was wearing black. If at all possible, sir, I really need all the help I can get at this moment if we both intend to leave. I wanted to say, of course, I've taken down two demons today and would be fucking thrilled to beg a third. Step aside, pal. What I said was, uh, uh, that's when I passed out. That's when I passed out. I don't know how long I was unconscious, but when I woke up, the demon was gone. I tried to get to my feet with a jerk, but was still too woozy to be spry. Relax, friend, and get your bearings. I have a feeling that we're in for a long night. I swung my head around wildly to search for the speaker emitting a soft cry when I realized that he was sitting next to me. Nearly invisible in his black clothing, he sat quietly with his arms wrapped around his knees. He was positioned so that he could watch over me, but he was looking at the stars. Oh, oh, where's the fucking demon? I managed to mumble. He's gone. The man in black replied simply. I crawled to my hands and knees and checked my body for damage. The air smelled like sulfur and smoke, and there was still a white powder residue ring around the two of us. But there was no further sign of a fire, let alone the conflagration that had nearly consumed us. My Pat down revealed a wound on my temple that was no longer actively bleeding. Nothing else seemed to be damaged. In a wave of panic, I checked my pockets. The watch was there, intact. So was the rosary. Where had I put the book? I tried to pull the memory from my throbbing head. It came fuzzily out. I had been holding it when the demon hit me. I hadn't had time to put it away. I used my hands to search the grass, which was completely occluded in the night, for any signs of it. It's gone, the man in black said, with a hint of sadness. What? How do you know it's gone? How do you know what I'm looking for? What did you do with it? I was gradually starting to get my bearings and I realized that I had a lot of questions. It made me choose, the man said simply. I waited for a further explanation because that was an obviously stupid response. When it became apparent that he would not go any further, I tried to get articulate. What? What? Like I said, my attempts to regain my bearings were gradual. The man finally turned to look at me. He had short brown hair that was parted neatly to one side and fairly light skin that contrasted with his black shirt and pants. Your book was obviously special. When the bull demon knocked you to the ground, it flew past the reach of the fire. I was worried that it would kill us both, but then the demon noticed it lying on the ground. When I followed its gaze, it smiled and allowed a gap in the fire for me to pass through. He sighed, wearily. I knew what it was doing. It wanted me to pick either you or the book, knowing that I would forsake whichever one I left. I chose to stay with you. It sealed the fire ring, stole the book from the ground, and walked away. The fire died down shortly after, and I've been here ever since. He ran his fingers through his hair. To be honest, I think that he wanted to witness a person losing something important more than he wanted to hurt either one of us physically. 
You see, he finished, it knows that physical damage ends with death and did not want to let us off that easily. He stood up and returned to gazing at the stars. The man in black said all of this like it was the most normal thing in the world. Who the fuck are you? He smiled visibly in the moonlight. Sebastian? He offered as a way of explanation and extended his hand. Peter? I responded hesitantly and shook it. So... You put down the ring of salt? It seemed like the right thing to do when the demon started that fire. I grabbed my hair in confusion. Right, right. But I forgot my salt, see? I don't know why I was trying to contradict him, but my mind was refusing to accept all of the facts. I brought my own, he replied simply. Ah! Though I did not doubt the honesty of his response, it only added to my confusion. You're confused by why I'm here, Sebastian responded, though it was not a question. More than a little was all I could offer. May I politely ask you the same question? He asked kindly. I... The thing is that I had felt so justified in questioning his motives, but suddenly my response of I've been hunting demons all day and just got back from a forest jaunt with my dead parents made me seem like the crazy person. I live here? Seemed like a good enough explanation. I see, he said in a calm yet urgent voice. And it appears that our questions will have to wait for another time. Why is that? I asked him suspiciously. Well, you say that you live here. Is that, by any chance, your house? He pointed over my left shoulder. I spun around to view a nicer shitting sight. My entire home was engulfed in flames. We were able to spring there in under a minute. My phone, of course, was inside the inferno. Do you have a phone? I screamed at Sebastian. Why? He yelled back over the flames as he ran up alongside me. I stared at him incredulously. To call the fucking fire department, professor? Do you have a phone? He shook his head calmly. It's a demon fire, he explained, then stood still and caught his breath. This did not satisfy me. I don't really give a shit what kind of fire destroys my home. I want it put out. Have you ever been burned by it? I suddenly remembered my hand. The one that showed no physical damage after being burned, yet still hurt like hell, actually. Sebastian could see realization dawning in my eyes. There were no scorch marks on the ground either, he offered. I looked up at the still burning house, then back at him. But won't it disturb the neighbors? He didn't flinch. No police or fire came when the bull demon surrounded us in flame. This was true. I don't think anyone can see it unless they want that person to see it, he offered. I turned back around to look at the flaming home, which had all the apparent subtlety of a sledgehammer to the groin. So, no one else can see this? Well, he countered, still talking loudly over the din. Where are your neighbors? I looked around. No one was out. Either I lived next to the world's most terrible people, which I definitely would have said about Buster while growing up, or he was bizarrely accurate. I looked back at Sebastian, bro furrowed. Who the fuck are you? I asked for the second time that night. 
I'm a priest by trade, but have recently been a full-time denized of the road, he explained, touching his nose delicately. In the firelight, I could see that it was slightly bruised and swollen. Believe me, I have a lot of questions for the man I encountered, unconscious at the feet of a supernatural monster, and based on what's happening to your house, you probably have more to answer than I do. But the stories will simply have to wait, he finished. And why is that? I shot back, not liking the fact that he was almost certainly right. Because, Peter, if we're the only ones who can see the fire, it means that they're sending us a message. A wall of ice cascaded down my back. And what message is that? I asked, secretly not wanting him to have an answer. Father Sebastian looked past me, across the series of shimmering windows and into the flaming attic. They want us to come in. Sebastian had enough salt for the both of us. It only stops the fire, I think, he offered. It won't do much against the monsters themselves. He poured some from one drawstring pouch into another and handed one to me. We can get more salt inside if they haven't taken it. We can collect a lot of things from inside if we're smart. My parents? They might have some surprises hidden throughout the house, I offered. He nodded, very matter-of-factly. Do you have any sunglasses or sage on you? I looked at him incredulously. No, I rarely bring sunglasses on impromptu nighttime hikes, I responded. He gave a wan smile. Ah, be glad if that question is the strangest thing to happen to you today. He pulled his own rosary from his pocket. I noticed that it seemed to be an exact replica of mine, but I realized that that, too, would have to be a story for another day. The demons learn the most about us from our eyes, he explained over the noise. They're more like people than anyone would care to admit. Sunglasses help with this. And the sage? It won't kill them, if that's what you're asking. It's a strong irritant, sort of like tear gas for monsters. Ah, huh. well, I'm fresh out of sage at the moment as well, unfortunately. I looked to his hand. And the rosary? I've seen it in action. He paused before speaking. That's a deep question. I'd love to have an extended theological discussion at a later date. Let me put it in this way. Would a stack of ten million dollars be a powerful thing? Money is power, I noted, glancing nervously at my inflamed front door. Of course it can be. But imagine if you had... 10 million dollars, and there was only one other person on earth. Imagine that that person did not care about the money. All of the power would be gone because it's only real when it creates an interaction between two people. But the power was only what those two people chose, created and gave of themselves in the first place. So, the rosary can be extremely powerful or worthless, depending on what you choose to make it. Do you understand? Not really, I responded honestly. Good, you're on your way to getting it then, he finished. Clearer answers than this were warranted. I really, really wish that I had my parents' book right now. What about this? I asked, pulling out the pocket watch. He eyed it curiously. I've never seen anything quite like that before. At least not for spiritual things. I think it, 
I was interrupted by a roar of flames erupting from an upstairs window. Peter, I think something's trying to get out. We don't have much time. I felt the sweat drip down my neck. Why does it want us to come in if we're planning to stop it? He ran his fingers through his hair again. They'll be more powerful if they can hurt something first, and I believe it thinks that we will serve that purpose, he sighed. But we don't have a choice. Whatever is in there will escape soon, and it will do so with or without taking in a couple more extra victims beforehand. But we can stop it, right? Well, they don't have any faith in us. We stood in silence for a moment. A fistful of salt spread wide across my front entry hall, flying from my outstretched palm in all directions. It was enough to cut a clear path through the fire. My black-clad friend and I walked shoulder to shoulder through the entry hall, flames licking upward, unable to reach us. Welcome to hell, I offered. Sebastian and I came to the end of the hall, which opened up to a living room. While demonic flames leapt across the walls, the floor was free of fire and uncannily dark. It took me several seconds to notice the girl. She was about six years old and sat bound to a chair across the room. Her wide blue eyes betrayed pure terror. Blonde pigtails shook in fear. She was unable to speak due to an excessively tight gag in her mouth and she was tied hand, waist and foot to the chair with several layers of rope. Her little legs were too short to even reach the floor. Son of a bitch! I screamed and ran forward to help her. Part of me knew that she was probably bait and that perhaps I should have just left her there. But how could I justify combating demons if I became one myself? I'd rather gain by losing than lose by gaining. I suddenly realized that I almost certainly did not know the truth about my parents' death and I charged across the room for her anyway. I was suddenly knocked to the ground, just feet from the girl. I could hear her high-pitched moans. I rolled around to face my assailant. Sebastian had me pinned. He was screaming, Get back! Get back into the hall! But I couldn't leave the girl. Even as he pulled me to my feet, I resisted and tried to reach her. Sebastian changed tactics. He spun around and placed himself between me and her, still grasping my neck with his right hand. The fire roared. Sebastian lifted up his left hand and shoved against the girl's chest. It was the hand with the rosary. An ungodly scream shook the walls of the house. The girl flew, chair and all, toward the back wall. She slammed against it and pitched forward. But she didn't hit the ground. Ten foot long appendages ripped from her torso, shearing the chair into a million pieces. The appendages, six of them, slammed to the ground and raised what was left of the girl into the air. They appeared to be metallic legs, flailing around like they belonged to a robotic insect the size of a truck. But its head stayed the same, pigtails and all, except that the whole thing was now blue, save for its yellow eyes. And God did it scream. The blue demon slammed its leg into the ground, sharp metallic points causing the wooden floor to splinter. I stared up at its innocent baby girl face in complete horror and disgust. 
Then its legs lowered the face down to hover above mine. It hung a tongue from its childlike head that looked like a human tongue, but for the fact that it was two feet long and blue. All of this happened in less than six seconds, and I did not react quickly enough. It lapped its long, unholy tongue across my face, deeply impressing it into my cheek. It was icy cold and extremely wet, and felt exactly like the world's mostly sickly rotten pitch. The tongue was evil. As soon as it had licked me, I couldn't stop myself. I fell to the ground and started crying uncontrollably, insatiably, huge sobs raking my body. I didn't care about the fire, I didn't care about Sebastian fruitlessly shaking my body, I didn't care about the demon above me or even about dying, because that tongue, that horrible tongue, it did something to me, it touched me deeply and I cried and cried and cried and cried and I cried. I cried and cried and cried and cried and I cried. It all came crumbling down. The loss of my parents. The secrets that they had been keeping from me. The dark road that it had taken me down. The fact that when I died, my friends and extended family would miss me but would get over it soon and I was facing the trial of my life with a stranger. I wasn't ready for this. I rolled over and blearily opened my eyes. Through the smoke and the tears I could vaguely see Sebastian fighting with the blue demon. It wasn't going well. Its six metallic appendages danced like a sewing needle around him. It avoided his rosary, but the sheer size and speed of the damn thing made the eventual outcome pretty fucking obvious. Why was Sebastian fighting so hard? It came to me quickly. He was distracting it from me. I suddenly felt a weight lift. Most of the demon's lick was still inside me. I could feel it, but I could feel some of it leaving too. The blue demon lifted one metal appendage to draw Sebastian's gaze, then quickly whipped a second one around his left side. It broadsided and did not cut him, but it was quite successful in knocking him to the floor. I decided that whatever metaphorical weight had lifted from me wasn't moving fast enough on its own. I got to my feet, tears and snot flying freely from my face. The demon whipped a triumphant leg high up into the air, then dropped it like a missile, pointed edge headed for Sebastian's chest. He didn't even have time to squirm. I didn't look too deeply into the cause of my parents' death. Carbon monoxide poisoning was the official cause, I think, and after having the house inspected for the all-clear, I stopped thinking about it. There was nothing to gain from knowing. We all walk around with a sense of immortality. 
We know that we're going to die in the same way that we know the sun is 93 million miles away and will consume our planet in another 5 billion years. We accept it, but not really. When I lost my parents, it was the first time that I truly understood that I was going to die one day. Have you accepted that? Really? I bet you haven't. I thought that I did. I was wrong. Sebastian didn't have time to move, nor, it seemed, did the demon. Time was working against it. Or rather, time was not working for it at all. The leg remained frozen in place. Its whole body stayed rigid, except for its yellow eyes. They swiveled around the grotesque blue little girl's face, peering over the hideous tongue that had been stopped in mid-furl. Sebastian gasped for air, leered wide-eyed between the demon and me, then shimmed out from underneath the pincer. There was less than two inches of wiggle room. He tore his black shirt on the way out. I stood, chest heaving, in the middle of my flaming living room. The Elgin watch was in my left hand, crown pulled, demon paused. Sebastian was slack-jawed as he climbed to his feet. Who are you? I'm a demon hunter, like my parents were before me. Now, step aside. The monster was powerless to move as I positioned myself underneath it. One leg was still raised above the ground, waiting to strike. I stood in the middle of the pentagram, formed by the points of its remaining five legs. I pulled out the rosary and stared up at the beast. My head swam with anger and sadness. I leapt straight into the air and swung my beaded fist into its throat. It sailed, legs and all, up to the ceiling, then landed with a crash on its back. I couldn't even hear my own screaming over the roar of the flames. I pounced and got to work. I ripped its legs, one by one, from its quivering body. I beat, punched, cried, screamed, hit and tore at the monster. Things got blurry. When all the legs were off, I picked them up and tried to break them. I cut my hands on the metal, dropped it and cut my feet when it landed on the floor. I yelled, pick up the metal again, cut my hands again and dropped it again. I cried. Something was wrong with my arms. They were discolored. The realization slowly crept up on me that the demon's blood was like acid and every part of me that it had touched was burning painfully. I got so angry when I realized this, so incredibly enraged. I decided that I was going to rip its eyes out, acidic demon blood be damned and that I would make it suffer, even if it reduced my hands to nothing but a fleshless collection of forgotten bone. Arms rubbed me from behind and pulled me back. Peter, you need to stop! It's killing you! I almost laughed at this. I'm killing it! How do you not see that? I struggled break free. Peter, stop! That is how it's killing you. Look at yourself! I peered down at my arms and legs. 
They were torn and bloody. My arteries must have been within inches of the cuts and burns. He swiveled me around, tightly grasping my shoulders. Look at me, Peter. Look at me. The things that hurt us, the things that make us sad, we can stop them from continuing to cause us pain. But those things never go away. They don't disappear when we heal from them. They continue to exist. We can't stop that. I have spent a lifetime trying to fight the truth. I turned my head to look at the broken and battered monster. It was stripped of all limbs and the battered blue face now no longer looked human. But I swear I could see it smile. It looked right at me and smiled. Peter, Sebastian sighed. Please, let this one go. I collapsed into his shoulder and started crying again. There simply wasn't time or space to recover. We walked into the adjacent dining room, which still had a variety of silverware spread out on the table, but thankfully featured no demons. Sebastian offered to go on alone, which really meant that he was offering to sacrifice his life. I declined. Look, Peter, you need to heal. You said that your parents might have some surprises hidden throughout the house. This is important. Do you have any idea where they might be? I shook my head glumly. I was in a depressive fog, but I honestly had no idea. I regretted having mentioned it at all. Think, Peter, is there any chance that they could have been hiding something from you? A hidden room, maybe? I snorted in the region. Hiding something? Yeah, clearly they were hiding something pretty fucking big. If they had anything that could help us, they hid that too. Every memory was beginning to hurt. I missed them, but was too pissed to want them around. And it now seemed entirely possible that they could have hidden something as significant as a room. Oh, shit. I breathed. I looked at the walls. I looked up at the ceiling. I looked back down at Sebastian. The spare bedroom upstairs. It faces the front yard and the backyard. Sebastian stared at me blankly. The house isn't built that way. It shouldn't look out onto both yards. He gave me a look of dawning realization. Have you seen out both windows? I wheeled around to face the stairway. Only out the back. Now that I think about it, my parents... I paused and swallowed hard. Never drew back the curtains on the front-facing wall. And you never asked about it? Sebastian replied as we started walking to the stairs. It seems that I was a rather oblivious child. I grabbed a carving knife from the pile of silverware on the table, in case I had to jimmy the window open. Who knows, my parents had locked me out metaphysically and maybe they would have ensured that was true in the physical world as well. I was discovering that, while painful, my wounds from the blue demon didn't stop me from moving forward. I wondered if that was intentional. We made it up the flaming staircase and into the first bedroom on the right with no incident. I burst through the door and advanced on the window curtains across the tiny room. They hung darkly still. I grabbed either side with my fists. 
it occurred to me that I didn't know what I wanted to find. Answers were the same as proof. Finding the truth meant finding the lies. I threw open the curtains, grabbed the seal and peered through. The window did not lead outdoors. It was the only room that was not on fire. I fumbled around for a light switch that worked and illuminated the space. It appeared to be some sort of a workshop and it had been ransacked. I ran around with a feeling of vertigo. No, 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 no! Who was here? I picked up scraps of things that had been left behind. Empty bags with torn labels reading salt and sage. Ripped pages of ancient books. Inexplicable pieces of equipment that would have made sense to my physicist mother. All of the lies and none of the benefit. All of the loss, none of the gain. Exactly the kind of blow that I did not need right now. I saw something on the opposite wall and nearly ran to it. Two unused brackets were mounted to the wall. A small plaque, the likes of which were used to label art at a museum, hung underneath. Various edge, blessed, sword. Oh, shit! I looked over at Sebastian. There was a sword that we could have used right in here. I punched the wall, lifted a forgotten piece of machinery and threw it across the room. God damn it! God damn it all! I bent down, ready to start crying again. Then I had an idea. Sebastian! I shot upward. Oh, Sebastian, my friend! Look what we have here! I raised the carving knife that I had brought from downstairs to him. He eyed me suspiciously, but did not flinch. You, you're a priest! I almost smiled. He did not react. You, you can bless this knife! We'll make our own demon sword! We'll be unstoppable! Peter... No, no, it will be perfect! <laughs> Balls in my cur now! Peter, I can't do that. I could feel my face growing darker. And why not, friend? He sighed. Because it's a weapon. Yes, I said, stepping toward him. That's the point! I tapped my finger lightly on the knife's tip. Look, Peter, your cuts and burns weren't extremely deep. Let's find something to patch you up, then let's move along. I slammed the knife onto a nearby workbench. That's not what's important right now, Sebastian. You, bless that sword, we... Finish this for good. I slammed my hand on the table. Do it! He stared back with no movement whatsoever. It was like he didn't hear me at all. Peter, a blessing means something. It's the sharing of a spirit in good faith of the giver. I'm sorry. I won't bless something that's designed to hurt people. This is about more than life and death, both of which are inevitable. It's about faith of spirit which is not. The room was free of flames, it's true, but I was beginning to see the first leaks of red appearing in my periphery curling their edges like they were smiling at me. Then get out. Go! I could feel the fire 
starting to burn hotter. I won't leave you here, Peter. That's a solemn vow. You already have left me. Now get out of my house. I could feel the flames catching. I could feel their strength. Sebastian did not move. You will leave or I will make you. My arms were strong, like tree trunks. I could feel it. They could cause pain. I could feel that too. Peter, it's the demon's lick. It's getting to you. You have to fight it. Have you stopped to consider that this is actually what I'm choosing? That I'm telling you to leave and let me finish my business on my own? That I'm telling you to get out? I charged forward, determined to make this happen. To get my way. To stop being overlooked. I knocked the wind out of Sebastian when I hit him and I lifted him off the ground. I ran for the window that faced the spare room and dove through it with my arms still wrapped around him. The landing then knocked the wind out of me and we both lay there gasping. Peter, he choked out, listen, here he was interrupted by a coughing fit. The only way to get past it, gasping, you have to let it go, coughing again. <laughs> Don't fight it, <laughs> he struggled to stand. The only way to get past, remember, he couldn't get up past his hands and knees. I helped him there. I had recovered faster than he did. So I picked him up and carried him out of the room and to the top of the stairs. They were engulfed in flames. I was going to exorcise this demon. Peter, please, he yelled, beginning to get some of his speech back. Please, to get past it, you have to let it go. Gladly, I said tears flowing freely. I pushed him forward, sending him tumbling down the fiery stairs. Demon released. Demon released. I had internally justified the belief that Sebastian deserved to be pushed down the stairs. Part of me knew right away that I had done the wrong thing, of course, and yet another part relished that knowledge. I vaguely thought about how I'd always considered the concept of the Trinity to be ridiculous, and part of me still believed that. But I knew that none of my competing thoughts could exist without the others. Tears welled in my eyes as I grinned. My mind buzzed. I was excited and horrified about the next step. I wheeled around to face the upstairs hall of my childhood home. It looked different in the flames, but something was calling to me something that I was missing. I gasped in realization of what I had to do next. I pushed Sebastian out of my mind. You pushed, you bastard, fetched the carving knife from the room and placed it in my belt, then headed down the hall. As I walked, I could have sworn that tiny flames leapt up from my footsteps. I rounded the corner and found that I wasn't alone. A sob hitched in my throat and I smiled. You came back? 
the bull demon stood tall enough so that his horns scraped the ceiling. Its tree trunk arms nearly dragged against the ground with the flames of the floor licking the tips of his fingers. The elongated snout placed his face squarely in the middle of human and bovine while the entirety of its eyes glowed yellow. I felt rage, bile and fear rise in my throat. It smiled. Fuck, it was an ugly sight, scrunching the skin snout in all of the wrong places. Its pointed one long finger, sharp tipped nail and all at the ceiling. Dangling from a string was my parents' book. I knew that the tantalizing offer meant it expected me to die while staring at the book longingly. I wondered how the demon planned to do it. It charged. So did I. I was arrogant. I used that. I knew the arrogance would weaken me. I feared that. The bull demon raised its arm and brought it crashing towards my skull. In a single fluid motion, I pulled out the watch from my left pocket and the rosary from my right. I swung the beads upward while maintaining a firm grasp and yanked the watch's crown with my right fingertips. Its arm froze in place and I cut the beads around its massive hand on the downswing. Fuck, I was good. The momentum from my charge continued to carry me forward. I moved past the demon and the resulting tension on the rosary pulled it easily from its cloven feet. I crouched, swung the monster over my head, though it must have weighed a thousand pounds, and brought it crashing to the floor. It whimpered. I realized that unlike the rest, this demon's strength did not come from conferring emotions through touch. It must have relied on physicality for intimidation rather than using a supernatural connection to its victims' minds. Intimidation used a person's own brain against them, making a person set their own mental trap was probably the greatest magic anyone ever pulled. Now it lay still at my feet. I felt strong. Then I wrapped the rosary around its neck, lifted it off the ground and squeezed. Sebastian had told me that the rosary was only as powerful as we allowed the interaction to be. Now I thought he was full of shit. I felt the power flowing through my arms as I squeezed. Then the demon started to deflate. I felt it get smaller with every clench of teeth, with every twist of muscle. Held back by the watch, it could only whimper. In the end, it was the size of a baby with tiny little knobs for horns. I pulled out the pocket watch again, clicked the crown back into place, and watched its legs kick. I smiled. Demon meet Hunter. It was such a rush to watch him struggle. I could feel the strength that had drained from him, rippling muscle and ironborn reinforced throughout my body. Perhaps I didn't need a rosary after all. I whipped the carving knife from my belt. I wanted it to watch. Its eyes went wide. It knew. I smiled wildly. Then I looked up. The book was dangling just above my head. A quote leapt into my mind. You can hope 
to defeat the angelic nature in the greatest of beings if you are unable to see the demonic nature in the least of them. Wait, no, that was all wrong. Did I scrub the quote? I looked at the baby demon, confused, and I started to shake. I knew in that moment that killing the demon would be my end. I don't know how I knew it or what would happen, but I knew I had to put down that knife. I dropped it to the floor. I was still pissed though, so I threw the tiny bull demon against the wall like I was Tom Brady. The little bastard hit the wall with a thrunk and rolled to the ground. It rose to its feet, made a squeaking sound like a literally goddamn Pikachu and ran past me and around the corner, legs and arms too short to bend any joints. I shook my head. The prize continued to dangle above me. I leapt into the air once, twice, thrice, and finally snatched it from the rope. I opened the book eagerly in the firelight, wondering what my proud parents would think. Remember that we are often weakest in our greatest moments of strength. I snapped the book shut in anger. Did my parents not realize just how fucking hard I had worked for this win? I decided to keep the book closed. If their insight was going to make a ridiculously difficult situation worse, then there was no need to pay attention. I wondered if listening to their own advice was what had caused them to die. And I felt a flutter of pride at not being so stupid myself. I turned toward the corner with supreme confidence. The bull demon's strength still flowed through me. I could feel it. It was a wonderful sensation of having faith that everyone else was weak. I loved it. Part of me loved it. A tiny voice said it was wrong. I judged that voice for being weak. I picked up the knife. I knew, just knew that I was stronger than anything that I would face next, that the following foe should fear my face and that nothing could intimidate me. I turned around the final corner and screamed. How many chins can a person have? Imagine seven times that number. Picture so many chins that they cover a person's chest and are indistinguishable from his elongated and droopy man breasts. Imagine a being so fat that it has no space for legs. Think of stubby arms that protrude from a man so large that they do not meet shoulder, but simply sink into a lumpy pool of lumpy skin. What would a tarantula's leg look like if it were 30 times bigger? What would its texture be if human skin covered its exoskeleton, but retained the bristy hair? Consider it how wrong it is to see upward pointed feet with no legs protruding from the sea of skin. In my humble opinion, fleshy octopus tentacles, suckers and all, had no purpose on a landbound creature. How would you feel about an eight foot long scorpion stringer protruding from a demon's back? Would it make it worse if I told you that it, too, was covered in human skin? Or that it swayed in curls like a cat's tail? And what the fuck is the benefit of putting a proboscis under an obese armpit? 
That being, with every one of those appendages, sat guarding the door to my childhood bedroom. It made eye contact and smiled. I was not dealing with this shit. I pulled the watch out. The beady eyes are lit with glee and all of the appendages quivered in excitement. They made a soft concert of slotch, click, clap and for some reason hi! The thing pulled up to its full height, massive frame filling my bedroom door. I tucked the book into my waistband, then pulled the watch's crown. It stopped moving. That's when I realized I had a problem. Every square inch of the doorway was filled with the thing. Even if I could climb over it, and I was not about to touch that shit, squeezing past would be impossible. I clicked the crown back into place. The demon came back to life, retreating a little from the frame. A little, not a lot. It smiled. I tried 13 more times before I realized that the demon was winning and it hadn't even moved. There was no way around it. This was the only door into my room. A solitary window, which could only be opened from the inside, was a sheer two stories above the ground. The hidden room on the other side had appeared to possess concrete walls. The only way in was through fatty. Since it would fill the frame every time I used the watch, only to retreat once I released him, it appeared that using it would be an impossibility. I tried another tactic. Rosary in hand and gag reflect in check, I advanced on the beast. Rippling muscle flowing and iron bone grinding, I geared myself up for the fight. I was stronger. I could feel it. I raised my fist and swung. My hand landed in the skin with a soft plop. I pulled back to see the skin sizzling where the beads had landed, but I quickly lost sight of it in the sea of flesh. The return punch caught me off guard. One of the arms had hit me equally as hard, and I fell stunned to the floor. I shook it off. Anger coursed through me. I picked up the knife and brought it down into the thing's skin. While some acidic blood oozed out, I again lost sight of the wound after I pulled the knife back. I failed to see the scorpion stinger come crashing down on my shoulder. That one fucking hurt. He drew back after a single strike, but it was enough to slam me to the floor and to open up a painful flesh wound. I shook this off too. Time to get drastic. No way around it. Rosary in hand, I stood up and ran at the thing, belly flopping into its skin. It felt like grilled chicken skin covering a prune-layered manure smoothie. I tried to raise my head, but my hand sank into it like the world's most sensitive tempurpedic mattress, so I could not push myself up. Then it took one of its human skin-covered tarantula legs and slid it across the back of my neck like it was playing a delicate violin. The hairs were so pointy, I eventually was able to swim through the flesh and roll back onto the floor, panting. I would not be trying that approach again. A flower vase sat on an end table. I picked it up and brought it down on the demon. An octopus tentacle came crashing down on my head with equal force. 
I grabbed a layer of fat and tried to stretch it far enough to meet the demonic flames that lined the hallway. Could demons be hurt by their own fire? Before I could answer that, the thing spat out blood from one of its open wounds. It landed on my arm and burned me. I howled in rage. I punched. I stabbed. Each blow was countered with another blow. Each stab fetched another needling from the scorpion tail. Neither its punches nor its stings were very strong or deep. It ensured that the monster would not deliver me a knockout blow. We could continue indefinitely. On its next punch, I collapsed to the ground and cried. There was no way out of this. No way at all. As I drew into my own pain, I tuned out the monster. I wonder if he would decide to stop playing and deal a decisive blow while I was sobbing. In that moment, I didn't care. The same emotions that had me so fucking arrogant not long ago now had me in a chokehold of doubt. I felt worthless. The arms wrapped around me as I sobbed. I let them. I was pulled forward toward the fleshy horror. I did not resist. The skin, the horrible skin, squished between my fingers as I climbed on top of it. I surrendered to the hands that were pushing me forward, too devastated to fight it anymore. They guided me, gently yet firmly, toward the demon's head, towards the demon's mouth. I surrendered to their will. It was just easier that way. I let it happen. I let it happen. Its tongue lapped my ear, leaving thick gobs of saliva inside. The unseen hands pushed me up toward its head while my hands grasped its chins for purchase. Up I went, and... I slid past its left ear, over its left shoulder, and tumbled down its back fat into the space beyond. I had gotten past the demon and into my room. I sat stupidly, legs splayed out directly in front of me. I blinked. The cascade of back fat spilled into the room. It quivered like jello, but the demon made no other physical reaction to my presence. It didn't even turn its head around. Then another body tumbled down the skin and rolled next to me. I stared, slack jawed. Sebastian got to his hands and knees, panting heavily. I had so many questions. I blurted what I felt was the most important one. Huh? Still panting, Sebastian got to his feet. Then he pulled me upright. I looked him in the eye. Then I dropped my gaze to the floor. I was no longer angry with him. Sebastian, I... I thought you were... I raised my head again. He was looking back patiently. What? I watched you fall. He blinked. Yes. Wait, did you think I was dead? My silence must have answered him. Peter, you threw me down some stairs, not a cliff. I opened my mouth to speak, but realized that I had nothing to say. He was right, of course. And since this is your house, you must realize that there's a landing halfway down. 
I only fell about eight steps. And did that hurt? I asked dumbly. Well, yes, it hurt. I hit my shin pretty badly on the table on the landing. He sighed. He smiled. But I've learned how to fall over the years. My mind raced around. But the fire on the stairs. Peter, we've both been dealing with the fire this whole time. It's mostly for intimidation purposes. It won't spread, and we're fine as long as we don't touch it. And if it gets close, we can put it out with salt. I try to understand one last thing. Why didn't you come help me earlier? He raised his eyebrows. You mean when you were still on your rampage after you had, I now realize, attempted to kill me? Well, shit. He had crossed every T's and dotted every I's. Sebastian, it's not that I was trying to kill you. I was... But then I trailed off. I tried to figure out what had been going on in my head. I realized two things at once. The first was that I had no idea why I'd reacted so aggressively to Sebastian. The second is that whatever had pushed me was still partially there. My head swam. I'm sorry. I felt shaky. He lay one hand upon my upper arm, then placed the other on my opposite side. He looked me in the eye. Peter, I forgive you. Part of me wanted to cry. Part of me wanted to finish what I'd started. Why? I asked. He dropped his hands to his side. The prayer of St. Francis says that it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. My soul hangs on that being true, he sighed. Everyone's does, doesn't it? I didn't know what to say. I don't think you've realized just how much the blue demon influenced you, he continued. I turned away from him. I hated knowing that he was probably right. I hated not being in control. I hated. A sudden realization hit. How did you get us past the demon? He was quiet for a moment. Then they set you up for a trap. I gave him a dim witted stare. I hung behind you after you threw me down the stairs. I flinched at this reminder. Another part of me smiled inwardly. I watched you fight the bull demon and I saw what was left of it run away. It sprinted right past me. Tell me, did you feel stronger after shrinking it? Like you had absorbed its essence. I still didn't know what to say, but apparently my facial expression confirmed his suspicions. He continued. Whoever put the demon there must have known you would take it easily. Would have known what feeling you had when you crushed it. They would have realized that you'd carry that feeling right into the next obstacle. I looked back at the wall of flesh in the doorway. It made a gurgling sound. I didn't know how to hurt it, I offered. Sebastian looked up at the ceiling. Remember when I was talking to you about the rosary? When you admitted that you didn't really understand, I told you that you were on your way to getting it. That's the issue here. You were so convinced that you needed to know how to hurt it. You never stopped to think about how not to hurt it. This does not make me less confused, Sebastian. He took a breath. 
I think this demon is some sort of a vengeance striker. How often did it hurt you? Constantly, I snapped, wondering if my skin was more than 50% purple at this point. I watched you, Peter. You sat for long stretches, crying and screaming, while it did nothing. It only ever hurt you when you tried to hurt it, and then it used some sort of appendage that was equal in quality and magnitude to what you had given it. I opened my mouth to disprove him. No sound came out. He knew how to respond to the watch too. It froze you out when you froze it out. Every response was met in kind. I did not like how much sense this was making. Wait, so how did we get past it then? His expression was inscrutable. I had a um, guess that this sort of game might be in store. Don't you remember the advice I was trying to give you just before the stairs? I felt a rush of shame, anger, and pride once again. Multiple spirits in the same body. Not specifically, no. Well, I was talking about the only way to get past it. I said you have to let it go. Don't fight it. That sounded crushingly familiar. So we just scrolled over it and it led us. I sighed. I thought you were trying to protect yourself when you said that. He shrugged. I made a solemn vow not to leave you. We were both silent for a bit. I spoke next. So that was the trap. They wanted me to defeat the bull demon and bring aggression to the vengeance striker. He nodded slowly. It's hard to fight a demon when fighting is the demon. I wanted to cry. So, he said, shifting the conversation, what is it in this room that they wanted so badly to protect? I smiled. At least I had gotten one thing right. I still knew what I had to do next. I put my arm around his shoulder. Sebastian, my friend, I think we're near the end of the road. Welcome to my childhood room. It turns out that there is a fucking monster under my bed. Sebastian, my friend, I think we're near the end of the road. Welcome to my childhood room. It turns out that there is a fucking monster under my bed. He looked at me skeptically. I took my arm from his shoulder and walked confidently to my childhood bed. I grasped the posts at the foot of it and pulled hard, pivoting the bed into the center of the room. Sebastian scuttled to the side. Beneath the bed, lay a doorway. Perhaps a portal would be a better word. It was a square trapdoor made of the exact same wood as the floor. I never would have noticed it with the bed covering it, but now that it was exposed to the world, and now that I knew what I needed to see, it was quite clear. I knelt down and gently felt along the edges. I saw writing and look closer. Numbers and words were etched into the wood. It seemed to say 10011987 Gorad 1913. I had no idea what it meant, but it seemed strikingly similar to my father's scratchy scrawl. Remembering where I had first felt the handle the previous afternoon, Though it felt much longer ago than that, I wrapped my fingers around the lip that I was sure would open the door. Peter, Sebastian warned wearily, are you completely certain that you want to do this? 
that you're ready for this. His words still evoked a slew of unbeaten emotions. Irritation, shame, eagerness, and anger. Definitely anger. I looked back at him with what I'm sure was the same level of weariness. Sebastian, do you know why I didn't kill the bull demon in the hall? He looked back silently, patiently. I sighed. My father taught me that I can't kill a demon while a demon still lives inside, that no weapon would work. I clenched and unclenched my fingers around the portal's handle, then looked down at the floor. I wouldn't have been able to kill that bull demon. Something tells me that, had I attempted it, things would have gone very, very badly for me. I looked back up at him. I still have two demons living inside. He took this all in silently. After a moment, he spoke calmly, choosing his words with deliberate discrimination. After he opened that door, Peter, there is no going back, for better or for worse. Whatever happens can never be undone. And that is why I follow the road forward, I responded with equal care. I looked down one more time at the portal. I was struck by the fact that no matter what happened on the other side of this door, my life would certainly never resemble its former self after I pulled it open. That there would always be a before and an after. Well, I thought, no one ever built a monument to the guy who played it safe. Very few statues feature guys eating Cheetos and scratching their balls on the recliner. I pulled open the door. A billow of intense heat met my face. I reeled back and looked up at Sebastian, who seemed genuinely scared. I rested the open door on the floor, stood up and gave him a grim smile. Welcome to hell. There was a ladder leading down, hewn haphazardly from the rocks in the wall. I have no idea how there was a rock wall underneath my second floor bedroom, or how the rock could only have a three foot wide opening through which we could climb. I had no idea who had carved the stairs or why its pattern which was perpetually crooked and was just off, seemed so sinister. I did not know where the heat came from. But the day had been strange, so I shook it off. We must have climbed at least 30 feet before hitting the bottom. It turns out that hell is much closer than we like to think much closer than we like to think and likely of our own making. I stepped away from the final rung as Sebastian followed after me. We were in a room. It was a cave that had a distinct occupied feeling, though we could see no one at the moment. There were several small fires on the ground. I got the eerie feeling that they were not natural fires and would be vulnerable to any salt that we sent their way. The light was just enough to reveal that we were in some sort of antechamber. The series of small fires lay in a great room just beyond the threshold in front of us. Sebastian and I looked at each other. The flames reflected off of his eyes, and the beads of sweat shone on his forehead like shattered glass. The rest of his face was dark. Peter, we need to be ready for what comes next. Rosa is out, he instructed. I did as he told, and checked my bag of salt. Still half full. 
I then pulled out the watch, knowing and feeling that I would need it soon, and I reached around for the book. Hold this pocket watch, Sebastian. I think you know how unique it is. It will be helpful. He took it solemnly. I held the book up to the firelight and opened it with both hands. I don't think we'll be able to get through what's next without the watch. My parents had known about the door more than they ever said. Far, far more than they should have said. I needed to see their words now. They owed it to me. It was impossible to read in the near darkness, so I wandered toward the flames in the open room. Peter, be careful, Sebastian warned. I think someone knows we're here. Don't worry, I just need to read this. A slam interrupted my response, nearly knocking me backward. I reeled, then looked behind me to see what had happened. A large metal door had closed on the antechamber, sealing Sebastian on the other side. I ran to the door and slammed on its surface, calling Sebastian's name. I could feel how thick the metal was just by pounding my palms on its face. I knew, even as I hammered as hard as I could, that my efforts would be fruitless. I finally stopped, heaving, and leaned my head against the door. I had no idea how I would get out, and though I had no idea what the room held, I was certain that I would not be able to face it alone. I felt like crying. I wanted my mom and dad. Then I heard a man. Hello, Peter. His voice was serpentine. I've been waiting many years for you. I turned around to a person I did not recognize. Despite this fact, I somehow knew two things were almost certainly true. This was not the first time that we had crossed paths. And he meant me harm. He looked old, nearly ancient, but in no way frail. His white hair was slicked back on his head, and his white goatee curled in under his chin. He wore a hideous, gaudy gold robe. The man was standing in such a way that the floor fires flanked him perfectly. He was clearly quite pleased. I started breathing heavily. The air, which was already warm, took on the quality of a suffocating blanket. Who... who are you? I rapidly tucked the book back into my waistband and hid the rosary in my pocket. He grinned widely. Guess, Peter. Hearing him say my name, the leather chills down my soul. It was just so wrong that he knew it. A word flashed into my mind. Are you Goran? I asked timidly. Very good, Peter, he said with a grin. When he spoke, a forked tongue flicked forth. I stilled myself, wondering what he had planned. I wish Sebastian were here. But I guiltily missed the watch more. My heart raced. Damn, it was hot. What are you? I asked, trying to sound bold. You know what I am, Peter. His eyes glowed yellow. But the other demons? Yes, all at work on my bidding, Peter. I am an elder. Things transpire because I wish, he said with a tone of finality. His words echoed menacingly throughout the room. I realized that I needed to start figuring out just what the hell was going on if I wanted any chance of getting back through that door. In retrospect, climbing through it seemed to be a very stupid idea. 
So why do you want to have me here? I pressed. He walked over to me in several long, quick strides. Because you closed the door, a cloud of sulfuric odor wafted from him. But something else was more distinct. I could see the pronounced, painful-looking bruises of four fingertips and a thumb visible on his neck just above the golden collar of his robe. I gasped. You're the one I sent back to hell, I said in a whisper. He glared at me. And I have been looking so forward to you joining me here. I pressed my palms against the rock wall behind me as shivers continued to run up and down my back. Everything felt so wrong. I was overwhelmed by the realization that my mistake in coming through the door was already far too long gone to fix. You... you said that I closed the door. A wicked smiled curved up Goran's face. The grin seemed to derive its mirth from diminishing all joy around it. Yes, Peter, but now you've opened it again. He looked wistfully at the sealed metal door. You see, my lesser demons can slip through much more easily in the same way that the smallest grains of sand slip so smoothly through closed fingers. But it has been so difficult for me to find an entrance. This house, though... He turned back to give me a sharp look. Your house is like a sieve. Due to a series of, let's say, procedures, over a series of years, the walls in between here and there have been much thinner. My breathing quickened, threatened to get out of control. How much had my parents done and over how long a time span? You'll imagine my surprise when, upon finally breaking through, I found myself frozen mid-rise. I had begun to think that I was about to face someone extraordinary. My mind was starting to spin. How much did he know? Was he aware of who my parents were? Who I was? Did I have any card to play at all? But I was wrong, Goren continued, eyes truly ablaze, forked tongue flicking. I faced a man who was nothing special whatsoever. My stomach dropped. If he was hoping to intimidate me, it was working. I realized quite quickly that you had no special qualities. That whatever pedestal you stood upon represented nothing more significant than an ant on the shoulder of giants. The heat was suffocating. The sulfuric air did nothing to help my heart rate, which was demanding more oxygen by the second. I... I faced you. I threw you back. I was saying it to myself more than I was to him. In between soiling yourself and crying about your hand, Goran spat in disgust. <laughs> Clearly, you were blindly following a path that someone else had set before you. No, I knew you'd be an easy enough target, that my expulsion would be temporary. He continued in a softer tone. I knew that you'd get my message to come home. I crouched to the floor. So, the whole trip here, it was to get me to open the door again? He rolled his yellow eyes. Yes, genius. Thank you. And now that it has been opened by the idiot who closed it, I will be free to pass through as I wish. I began to control my breathing. I had to. 
the demons that I had faced within and without were real. No one could take that from me. Goran knew it too. He was getting inside my head. I was letting him. Time to stop. Time to think. Sebastian said, he laughed. <laughs> I have watched him for some time. He must realize that his weakness is overwhelming faith. Do you regret the faith-based decision to enter the house and open the door? I started looking around for something. Anything. There had to be a way to solve this puzzle. Or at least something I could do to claim that I was trying when I died. That may very well have to suffice. A passage of my father's text ran through my mind in that moment. Never, ever forget, he had warned, that any battle worth fighting is one that you may very well lose. My eyes desperately scanned the room, the walls, the fires. The hopelessness was starting to press down on me like a weight. And then I saw it in the flames. I looked quickly back to Goran. Your lesser demons, they can pass back and forth? They can come back here after going into my house? He took five steps toward me. When he spoke, it was in the lower tone of two friends sharing a secret. Peter, if you're trying to distract me so that you can fetch it out of the fire, you're going about it all wrong. Come here. Dazed, I could think of nothing to do but follow him. My hands clutched the rosary in my pocket, but something told me not to use it yet, that I would regret showing the only advantage I had. And please, don't plan on using those beads against me, Peter. He turned to look at me as we walked. His face was serious. Believe me, I know how effective they were. The purplish marks stood starkly out in the firelight. And that is your disadvantage. I know how effective everything at your disposal is. Can you say the same about me? He stopped and smiled next to one of the fires, and wreathed in a ring of the flames, resting against a stone pillar in a tiny island of floor that was free of fire, lay a sword. I knew exactly what it was. It would have fit perfectly into the empty brackets in my parents' secret room. Blessed by two different popes, Goran offered enthusiastically, sure to slay any demon that haunts you. My mind spun with what options I had. Half a bag of salt was enough to form a protective barrier, but nowhere near sufficient to cut into the huge ring of flame before me. Should I go for broke? Just spring through the fire and take it in hopes that it would catch him off guard? Would I survive such a stunt for even a few seconds? Peter? He offered condescendingly. Stop trying so hard to figure out a way to get the damn sword. He turned and walked to the middle of the room. The truth is, he called over his shoulder, I'm just going to give it to you. He waved his hand casually and the flames instantly disappeared. I stood dumbfounded. It had to be a trick. When I went to pick it up, he would just barbecue me, right? But what choice did I have? If I was going to die, I could at least say it was standing upright on the two feet of an idiot. Honestly, it seemed like the best of limited options. My vision swam as I walked across the stone floor that had been aflame just moments earlier. I closed the distance to the sword 
then got near enough to touch it. I took a deep breath and picked it up. Nothing happened. It was heavy in my hand. Goran called to me from the center of the room. Bring it over here, Peter. I could hear the wicked grin in his face, even though I was looking down at the sword. I have something to show you. I looked up at him and took several tentative steps forward. He extended his arm to the darkened back of the room, gaudy golden robe dangling freely. Someone wants to meet you, Peter. One shadow, then another, emerged from the darkness. I know that you have demons left to slay, he went on. His voice got quieter, but it echoed so much louder in a place that seemed to have gotten very still. And no one leaves this room until that battle is over. Some won't leave at all. Wave after wave of nausea hit me. My trembling thighs gave away and I fell to my knees. The two figures were still hidden in shadow, but I could see tiny flames flicker below their footfalls as they walked forward. Were their eyes glowing yellow? I couldn't tell for sure. Come on now, Peter, Goran said in mock encouragement to my kneeling frame. You really should rise to the occasion. There emerging from the darkness with inscrutable expressions on their faces, stood the figures of my parents. Come on now, Peter, Goran said in mock encouragement to my kneeling frame. You really should rise to the occasion. There emerging from the darkness with inscrutable expressions on their faces, stood the figures of my parents. They walked slowly, deliberately, toward where I stood. Then they separated, my mother headed to my left and my father pacing around to my right. They were flanking me, their faces showed neither joy nor sadness. My breathing became shallow. No! No! You're not... This isn't real! I began to heave. I thought of the last time that I had seen them, lying so still. Their faces had been expressionless then too. I panicked. This is not who you are. This is not who you are! I brandished the sword at my mother, then turned to face my father, trying to back away from them both at once. I know, I know what I saw when I went to visit Buster Duncan. It wasn't him. It wasn't real. I turned and pointed the sword at Goran, but... I knew that it would be impossible to intimidate him as I continued to back away from where he was standing. I could see him smile. These are nothing more than the demons I've been carrying inside myself, I shouted at Goran. The tip of my sword quivered. He threw his hands out in a mock shrug. If you're quite sure, Peter, then put actions to your words. My parents now flanked me equally on both sides, 180 degrees apart from one another. They each stood about 20 feet from me. They were still for a moment, then began to enclose me. Peter? Goran's voice echoed in the cavernous room. Why do you show so much fear of the demons that guide your life? I darted quickly away so that I was no longer in between my parents. 
they simply turned and began walking to my new location. They seemed so patient with me. This may be the first time that I have met you, Peter. Goran's voice boomed throughout the room, as though the walls themselves were talking to me. But you've encountered me so many times throughout your life. I ran behind one of the fires on the floor, but quickly realized how bad of an idea that was when my mother walked around one side and my father circled the other. Down here, you can see me as a man, but out there, I could only exist as a phenomenon. People learn to live with all numbers of demons in their lives, but become so frightened when they see us for what we are. No one fears the devil, Peter. It's finding out that he's been living inside you the whole time that causes you to run away screaming. I ran and leapt over the fire just before my parents could reach me. I tumbled to the ground, dropping the sword as I landed. I have dodged the flames, but they still burned as I passed them. You've seen me so many times, Peter. You accepted me then. I looked up from the ground, chest still heaving. You remember that accident during your senior year of high school? My breath stopped short. His wicked smile wildened. One car wreck. Four high schoolers. Four grieving families. Your good friend Ryan, who had wanted to spend time with you that night, was one of them. My blood turned to ice, despite the heat. That was me. I stood up and grabbed the sword. My parents continued to be just a few steps behind. Everyone blamed everything. Themselves, each other, the victims, the people who were there, the ones who weren't. But it was just happenstance. And that was harder to accept than reason. In the end, though, everyone had to accept it and move on. They gave in to the fact that there was no explanation. Peter, I am the bad thing that happens for no reason. Tears were running down my cheeks. Losing Ryan just before high school graduation had fundamentally changed who I was and it came right on the cusp of adulthood. In many ways, it had been the transition. But it made you more responsible, Goran continued. You've been a cautious driver ever since, always remembering the fact that Ryan's head was found 60 feet from the car. It caused you to grow up. You see, Peter, I am a part of you. I clenched the sword in a white knuckle grip and began jogging toward Goran. The thought of causing him pain flooded my mind. For a moment, I could think of nothing else. He threw his hands out as though to embrace me. Yes, Peter, yes! I stopped. It is impossible, completely impossible, to kill any one of them while a demon still lives inside. I looked back at my parents, with them on one side and Goran on the other. I was completely surrounded. They still wore no expressions. I turned toward them. It's inevitable, Peter. 
Goran continued slowly from behind me. I have only been able to exist outside this place as action, as an event, in the same way that particles and waves can switch back and forth but never be both at once. But it's time for things to change. It's time for you to open that door. I looked back at the entrance to the room where the metal barrier still closed off my escape. He was right. This was inevitable. I was suddenly struck by a thought. If these beings were not my parents, wouldn't my actual family be able to talk to me still? Would they hear me in hell? I whipped out the book and read as fast as I could. If you're fighting someone who is better armed than you are, son, then be wise and don't match him head on. You can't rise above. So go down. The book was ripped from my hands by my father, Demon, and it crashed to the floor. My mother, Demon, grabbed my arm. A feverish chill ran through my biceps and into my torso. In that moment, a flood of realization ran through me. I had truly, truly not processed my parents' death. I had not dealt with a great deal of things surrounding their life either. This moment was inevitable. I ripped my arm away. It tore from her grasp easily. My father grabbed my shoulder with a vice grip. A cold fever poured down my back and crept out my neck. I felt like gel inside. I pulled myself violently from my father, then ran between them away from Goran. My legs felt like cement, and I only made it about five steps. Despite the bite, the fox was waiting for you. Remember that. I turned to confront them both. A physical release and a spiritual release are often inseparable from one another. I stood squarely facing them, though my legs quaked in fear. Nausea raged through me like a stormy sea. I trembled as I spoke. Whatever you two are, you don't have to wait anymore. I could see Goran looking at me in curiosity. Mom? Dad? You hurt me. I took a deep shaking breath. I, when you were alive, we never talked as openly as we should have. I stumbled at first, but the words quickly formed themselves in my mind. I held back. You held back. Your secret? It destroyed you and may very well destroy me too. We kept our distance when we communicated. In a way, I think we were afraid of each other. The two figures continued to close in on me. I did not move. Our distance in life continued in death. I kept myself removed from dealing with the fact that I lost you both. I took in a quivering gasp. The figures were a dozen feet away. I used that distance in life to run away from you in death. Because facing the loss meant letting you hurt me so, so much more than I had believed I could hurt. So I used your mistake to keep you at my arm's length. 
My parent demons reached where I stood. I pointed the sword down in my right hand and made a fist. I pressed that fist against my father demon's chest and held my palm squarely against my mother demon's shoulder, keeping them firmly in place. I was crying openly now, salty tears mixed with saltier snot. I wondered vaguely how many of history's great moments of triumph were actually solid by the inconvenience of being human. I raised my voice. It sounded more confident than I felt. You made a mistake in hiding the truth from me. You made a mistake in keeping an emotional distance from me. You did the wrong thing because you were human. The demon parents strained against me, trying to force my arms away from them. I took all of my strength to hold them for the moment, but I knew that I would only be able to keep them at bay for a few seconds longer. I was nearly shouting now. But I know that you... you loved me, I know! And I understand the fact would be nothing, nothing, if it came from something perfect. It can only mean anything if the person has the potential to fail. And you made me feel loved. I gasped. I cried. I slipped and dropped a knee to the floor. I couldn't hold them back anymore. The sword fell from my grip and landed on the stone with a clatter. Even if you don't say it, I said through sobs, I know how much you loved me. I let out a great sniff and looked up at Goran. He was watching stoically. But... You're right about one thing, Goran, I yelled across the room. It is time to rise to the occasion. I launched myself up from the kneeling position and thrust my hands forward. My demon parents shrieked, then fell back on the stones. Each made a sickening thud. I dry heaved, then turn my head upwards. Mom! Dad! I was distant too! I was wrong! I shouted to the rafters, the sound reverberating with an energetic echo. I'm sorry! I forgive you for everything! Completely! I felt a lightness rise up from my feet and lift my shoulders. I hope you can forgive me too. And I hope you know just how much you taught me. It's the greatest regret of my life that I did not release these demons before you died. But I'm not going to embrace them any longer. Even if it hurts to let them go. I looked down at the ground. The beings were scrambling to their feet. I continued in a shaking voice. Please know that I'm able to follow the lessons that you've left for me now. To be fair, I also would have doubted my ability to see them to the end. The parent demons were on their feet. I dashed to the ground and picked up the sword, then took two quick steps back. My head swam. There was no more waiting. It had to happen now. Remember that we are often weakest in our greatest moments of strength. 
fuck, my father was so right. But you too, I shouted at the figures before me, are not my parents. I raised the sword and screamed. They would have been drinking chamomile. I slashed the sword across the man's throat, splitting open a geyser of blood. He fell to the floor. With cinnamon! I drove the sword through the woman's neck. It burst through the other side. Her eyes bulged. I yanked the sword back and she collapsed. I lowered the weapon to my side, but remained on my own two feet. I was weeping uncontrollably. Thoughts wavered in my head like light reflecting off a river surface. Did having power mean nothing more than accepting how little we can control? Am I going to be alone forever? Is solitude an angel or a demon? Do I have more demons to count? Do I have more demons than I can count. Did I just do the right thing? I opened my eyes to see a furious Goran. No, not furious. Afraid. He had not believed that I could do it. He had set me up to watch me fail. And he had not planned on what to do if... His hopes went awry. I could see him now. And he could see me as well. His arms erupted in livid bright demon fire. And he charged at me. Sweat, snot, tears. Blood that wasn't my own. I did not feel enwreathed in the laurels of the greatest. But it's all I had to offer the moment before me. I ran at my demon, slipping between the twin forms of my parents on the floor. I did not have to check, but I knew that they wouldn't be rising again. I remembered Goran's inflamed figure when I had faced him earlier. I remembered how much it had hurt. I did not feel brave. I felt obligated, so I acted. Maybe that's where parents come from, I thought vaguely. The demon was bearing down on me. He was fucking terrifying. Goran spread his arms, wicked smile revealing his forked tongue as he prepared to burn me. If you're fighting someone who is better armed than you are, son, then be wise and don't match him head on. You can't rise above, so go down I lowered the sword and slid it across the ground. It passed harmlessly between his feet. His eyes gleamed. I dove to the ground and curled into a ball, spinning and rolling at my attacker. I collided with his knees in a violent crash. A moment later, I heard the crack of his head hitting the floor. I scrambled to where the sword had come to a rest, grabbed it and charged at Goran. He rolled onto his back and swung his flaming right arm at me. No more demons hiding inside. I swung the sword at his arm, cleaving it off at the elbow. Goran shrieked as a fountain of blood erupted from the stump and immediately started burning his clothes. He was quick to swing his fiery left arm at me, and I swung at his left elbow. 
I chopped the left forearm off like it was rotten, like he was rotten flesh. He gasped. He screamed. Then he steadied himself. Goran painted desperately. Wait, Peter, wait, wait! I want to talk to you. I, I underestimated you. You want to learn, don't you? He propped himself up on his bleeding stumps. Yes, I know you hate me now, Peter, but you're logical. Your parents were logical. Your life is entirely different now. There is so, so, so much to learn. I can teach you so much. I'll show you it all in exchange for my life. I could see tears in his eyes. I paused. He was right. Everything was different. The ones who could have taught me, who should have taught me, were gone. There was simply no changing that. My life would never be the same again. There was a before, now this was after. And he could teach me everything that would now define my life. I had beaten him. Did I really have to kill him? He sensed my hesitation. There are so many things I know, Peter. He sounded weak, but calm. Tell me, how else will you learn them? I looked down at the being that had caused me so much pain, that I had made so weak. I raised my sword. I guess I'll just have to read it in a book. I drove the sword through his skull. The tip erupted on the other side. Goran screamed for the last time. His body immediately burst into flames. The pain of the heat was intense, but I stood in place, hands on the sword in an unwavering grip. The fire was hot, but not long. The screams echoed into silence. I was soon standing over a pile of ash. Demon Zelaid. I knew I shouldn't. My mind told me not to. But it was a battle that my mind lost this time. So, I stood over what was left of my defeated enemy. I felt a wicked smile slowly, inevitably creep across my face. The cool night air was a welcome antidote to the stifling hell below. I looked over at Sebastian. His face was the picture of serenity as he looked out onto the eastern sky. The horizon was purple, seriously considering the transition to pink. I was exhausted. I'd offered Sebastian whiskey, but he told me that he didn't drink spirited beverages. I'd offered him coffee, but he had turned me down for the same reason. So... He and I sat on the roof of my parents' house, watching the sunrise, sipping chamomile. I broke the peaceful silence. I wonder how long the metal door had been unlocked before I opened it. Do you think I would have died in there if I hadn't killed Goran? Did I need a demon's release? He sipped his tea continuing to stare at the horizon. Peter, did you really want the door to be unlocked before it was? I was flabbergasted that he would ask such a question. But then I realized that I had no retort. Thank you for waiting for me on the other side, was all I could think to say. I drained my mug. The sky was beginning to turn orange. The face of the pocket watch started to emit the smallest reflection 
but my parents' book remained in shadow. Are you going to read any more of it, Peter? Sebastian asked. I sighed and put my mug back down on the roof. No, not right now. I struggled to find the words. I believe that they're still out there. Wherever there is. I leaned forward and wrapped my hands around my knees. This book, it doesn't change. It's written. But my experience isn't. I... I don't have much of my parents anymore. I don't want to use what little is left so soon. I wish I had realized that earlier. Sebastian sipped his tea. What's done can never be undone, Peter. He turned to me. He looked exhausted, but no trouble. There's no one left to punish for what happened. Don't volunteer for the job. He turned his eyes back to the horizon again. Orange was giving way to yellow. We sat in silence for several minutes more. You know, I continued, I'm still pretty baffled about how we crossed paths. I know there's an entire separate story there, and I'm just one small chapter in it. He nodded contemplatively. Do you think that all of these stories will affect one another? He smiled. All rivers find the sea. When the sun finally made its appearance, I was overwhelmed with the need to fall asleep. I rubbed my eyes. So, what about you, Peter? Sebastian asked. Are you going to find out more about your parents? Or will you just let this all go? I smiled. No, I responded. Nah, Sebastian, there's no going back. I think that this is just the beginning. It's in the dustiest books that you may find in the best stories.